And it's a real pleasure to uh, do something like this. And especially in this time of isolation, it's, um, I think it's the perfect thing to be uh, giving out to the, the cello bello audience. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, my name is Brandon Cho. I am a cellist, obviously. I um, grew up in New Jersey and I studied at the Northwestern University um, for under, undergrad. And then I did an artist diploma at the New England Conservatory. And since September, I've been in Germany uh, at the Kronberg Academy. Um, but of course, uh, traveling all the time and um, busy with uh, concerts and, and whatnot. Um, uh, one second. trying to figure out how I can see these comments. Um, hmm. Okay, for some reason I can't seem to access these comments. Uh, oh. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, I hope everyone's staying healthy and um, happy and entertained at home during this time. Uh, it's really the only thing we can do to help speed this process along. And um, if you're an essential worker, thank you so much for um, helping us survive, really. Um, I, it's been really inspiring to see um, all, all these creative juices flowing of these artists on, on social media uh, and inspiring each other and putting together projects that would have never happened um, under different circumstances. So uh, I've been really inspired, uh, really touched and comforted. Um, personally, been trying to stay steer clear of the pressure of um, putting something out there that doesn't come from deep inside, you know, this uh, result of a desire, a yearning to produce something. Um, uh, so until that time comes, I'm relatively quiet and, and enjoying the works of others and um, the positivity going around in the world. Uh, so before, before I get um, pummeled by questions of uh, the usual how do I drill this? How do I play this in tune? Um, the, the, those very basic questions. Um, I wanted to talk about something that's, uh, that I've been thinking about a lot in the past few years and, um, something that, uh, something that a lot of people don't talk about, I, I think. Um, Yeah, so before I get to the questions, I'll, I'll ramble a little. Um, the the thing, things that I've been thinking a lot about in my practice um, is, of course, uh, as a soloist, or um, even when you're playing chamber music, uh, when you have a solo voice, um, it's much easier to sort of pop out when, when you have this sort of three-dimensional aspect to your sound and your 
phrasing and, and direction. If it, it's, um, I see a lot of people playing, you know, back and forth, you know, A to B straight, you know, it's loud and soft, or it's fast and slow, very one dimensional. And um, I think we can all agree music is a lot more than that. And communication is a lot more than that. Um, and that's what really grips me as an audience member, as a listener, when someone is, um, you know, popping out in different ways than than volume or speed or, um, and that aspect is completely and utterly connected to how you approach your technique. Um, I'm a firm believer in in that technique and musicality aren't separate things they're they're you need the technique to express everything that you imagine um that you feel that that you're going for um and uh a lot of times when i was younger i would um you know i was given you you're given a set of tools a set of techniques to use um and you solidify them you know straight bow good vibrato, good sound, in tune, um, which is sort of meaningless for me. I don't really know what a good sound, good vibrato uh, is. Um, it's uh, the sound that you need for a particular instance in a phrase, a particular character, a particular direction, a, um, that that's the sound that you want, not a good sound. Um, so this uh, three dimensional aspect that I'm talking about of communication when you perform um, di di translates directly into your technique and what you're doing technically to, to achieve that. Um, I'll talk first about the bow. Um, there, there's a lot of different axes, uh, planes, or dimensions that you can use your bow with. Um, one, so the first one is this, this way. So uh, this is the one everyone talks about, everyone's aware of, you know, we call it tip up or tip down. Um, directly affects where you are on the string you know, up or down, the contact point, as we call it. Um, and I personally, I manipulate this with my fingers very much. So pulling from either this side or from the pinky side. Um, so instead of using the arm or the wrist, um, being very sensitive with the fingers and um, uh, of course um, a lot of people talk about this but you know down bow if you want to go down on the contact point you put your tip down let your let the bow go down if you want to end up there uh, down bow if you want to go up tip up um, and this, the opposite with the uppos. And um, it's, it's good that people talk about this from an early uh, point because that's just one more tool that you can use to change your sound rather than, you know, pressure up and down. Um, uh, Um, another, uh, axis that I, that I think about, uh, one that a lot of people aren't aware of or don't talk about very much is, um, the, this axis. So if I, if I'm showing you correctly, this, uh, 
where, which side of the string am I on? So the string, we all, a lot of people, you know, you might think of it as a line, you know, one dimension line between A and B, and it's really not, it's a, the string is a cylinder. It's a cylinder. Um, so thinking about this contact point, you know, where am I on this side of the string? Am I on this side of the string? Am I on top of the string? Um, that's, that's a contact point that most people don't talk about. And um, my former teacher, Lawrence Lesser, talks a lot about this. And um, he in introduced this I idea to me very, uh, a, a, a few years ago. Um, couple years before I started actually studying with him and um, uh, you know at, at first for a long time I was like this is so unnecessary like who who does this it's I can make a good sound <laughs> without doing this I can um, I don't need this and um, and then slowly he started you know building this into me and and over a long time, maybe a year, it took me of f constantly feeling around like which side of the string am I playing on? Um, he, he talks a lot about the when, when you're on a down bow, you reach over to this side of the string and pull from that side. Um, and when you're on an up bow, you push from from this side, um, it's very much like pizzicato. Uh, so it, when you pits, you you know pull from that side, or you push, or you push from this side. And so thinking about it that way, um, to get the string to spin, which is actually what it's doing. It's not moving side to side, it's spinning. So um, really grabbing the string from the other side and instead of going vertically and pressing. Now this, um, you can get a good perspective on where these limits are uh, by playing two strings. Um, so, and then lift the bow just off the top string. So you're right above the top string, but you're not actually playing the top string. And that's where, that's the point at where you're on the left side of the D string. And then on the up bow, the other side. So a lot of times, I'm, I'm controlling by looking at this angle, um, uh, how far on the other side of the string am, am I? And um, yeah, it's made a really big difference in how I make the, uh, how I get the depth of the sound, really. Um, that's, that's a different kind of depth than and just so you know, I'm using the same amount of pressure. The, the vertical pressure is the same. What I'm adjusting is the side of the string and the speed. So um, when you, when, when I, on the other hand, when I want a sort of fast bow, an airy bow, I, I need to uh, get from here to here very quickly and lightly. I, I go on the top of the string. So what I was saying is you want to grab on the sides, but sometimes you want to be really light. You go on the top and you're, you're sort of skimming the, the, the surface, sort of ice skating on the top. Um, so it's a, you're, you're able to, without consciously being like, okay, less pressure here, you're able to move your bow faster because of 
the the lesser tension on the the string um on because of which contact point you're on um so that that's a big part of uh what i think about in every bow stroke really like which side of the string am, am i um the third axis that um some people talk about is um, this, this angle. So, yeah, it's about, you know, how much hair are you playing with? Um, my, my former teacher, Hans Jensen, um, a lot of times in, uh, when you're playing softly, he says, play with one hair. Um, which means, you know, this angle, you know, play with this side of the hair. And it's not just playing soft, it's a totally different sound. It's a different density of the sound. It's a different um, consistency. It's versus so um, if you if you watch um, Daniel Shafran play in those old videos on on YouTube, uh, there sometimes there's this camera angle of um, this this angle from the side, and you can see just how much he's manipulating this this angle. Um, it's really incredible. Almost every bow change has. Uh, the infinite range of this axis um, and uh, so that's a that's another that's a third contact point that uh, we're talking about um, when using the bow so like where on the hair are you playing how much hair are you playing with and um, this is uh, so all of those combined um, they you make different combinations of these three and um, they allow you to shape the sound, um, phrase the sound, you know, direct the sound in totally different ways and um, outside of pressure, uh, how heavy or light are you? Um, and uh, now I wanna talk uh, about the left hand three, being three three dimensional in the left hand as well, um, because as I said, the string is a cylinder. It's you know we we don't just play you know on one point uh, all the time. Um, the so it, for the left hand, there's this axis. Of course, that we're all aware of. There's this axis, um, which you have to be careful with because I I I use it um, very in in very minute amounts. You know differences. Um, you have to be careful that your wrist doesn't go like this or um because i see a lot of cellists playing like this uh with the wrist collapsed and that means this leverage from the elbow is going straight into the wrist it's stopping right here uh and i mean why like you're not <coughs> playing with your your wrist um it it should I try to keep the wrist relatively straight for the most part you know there are little differences but I try to imagine the leverage from the elbow goes straight into the tip of the finger so that um, this also helps a lot with like if if you need to have more weight on a finger instead of 
pressing the finger down harder with these tiny muscles engage your elbow a little bit you know use that leverage to just put your finger deeper into the into the fingerboard um so yeah there's there's that axis so this 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 you know um a lot of times when we play fifths we have to go like this or um when we when we uh need to reach with the fourth finger we go like this so that's another axis that i tap into so um it's really about helping your fingers get to where they need to be um, in a three-dimensional way. Um, it's also the, the on the fingertips, it's uh, like where on the fingertip are you playing? Are you playing on the, the very tip? Um, usually for faster things. <laughs> You wanna you wanna be as clear as possible on the tip. Um, for sometimes vibrato, um, you wanna be more on the flatter part. Sometimes, um, depending on where you are. Uh, so that's another dimension. Uh, where on the where is the contact point on the finger? Um, one one more point that I want to address is the um, a lot of times when we're playing in thumb position, uh, when we have a half step between the thumb and the fir the index finger, it's very uncomfortable, right? The it's like, do I use the nail? Do I collapse the finger? Do I what do I do? It's so uncomfortable. Um, I, I find it helpful to engage this knuckle. Um, a lot of times we only think about like, when we collapse the finger, we only think about this joint, this first joint, and about those possibilities. But this is a joint as well, this, this. So, whether it's like that or like that, you you elevate the palm or you lower the palm. Uh, that I I think about that as well when I'm in thumb position and things are getting kind of uncomfortable. Uh, like where do I have to put my my palm in order to help my fingers get to where they need to be. Um, so uh yeah it's a, a lot of these different sides of technique that you can engage as tools to um to express more like infinite sides of your musicality and and what you want to express uh it's sort of like a lot of people look at technique as this thing and they they look at it like like this you know and I like to look at it, you know, different from here, from here, from here. Uh, take it apart, look at it from the inside, you know. What's, what are the possibilities um, in, uh, according to my body, like what I need to adjust to help uh, make things more comfortable. And um, these are really nuanced and, and subtle changes, like, none of these should be exaggerated because the moment they're exaggerated it it doesn't work it goes out of control um so it's almost like every bow stroke every hand position you shift to is uh you're you're thinking of adjusting these uh different points of your your technique um so with that being said, uh, I'm going to try to figure out how to 
see these um, comments. Um, one sec. Um, sorry. Ah, there it is. Uh, yes, as I expected, how to practice, how to play in tune, how to drill, the typical. Um, oh, I, I want to get to this question. To clarify, on Dumbo, you play on the side of the string closer to the higher string and oppo on the side of the string close, closer to the lower string. Um, yes, exactly. So, think about pizzicato. Uh, up bow, you grab from this side and push, right? So you're on this side of the string. Down bow, you grab from here and pull. So you're on the upper side of the, the string. Um, um, Oh, and <laughs> just to, there's a question about my cello. It's a, uh, it's made by Antonio Cassini um, in Modena, Italy in 1668. And um, yeah, I'm very lucky to have it. And I've been playing on it for about five years now. And um, it's, it's not a simple, cello to play it's very that's that's why i've had to develop this sort of three-dimensional aspect of my technique because the moment you just do one bow straight um it, you're you're missing out on a lot of the depth a lot of the sophistication of the sound of this instrument so um that's where my ears have led me uh, in my technique to um, sort of look for all these different sides. And um, that brings me to the, the, you know, with a lot of particularly soloists, uh, famous soloists, um, a lot of them have very unique technique, um, things that you don't learn in school, things that you're not taught from the beginning. Um, uh, you look at Jian Wang or Trolls Mork or um, Yo Yo Ma, Rostropovich. Um, the, each, each person has a unique sound which is created by a unique technique. Um, that's where their ears have led them to over the years. Um, it's like, how do I achieve this sound that I imagine? And what do I change to uh, achieve that? And that's the, how their technique has evolved uniquely uh, and, and molded into these, these unique set of tools that they, they use. Um, uh, let's see. What was my preparation process for the Paolo competition? Um, very similar to um, a lot of uh, when I entered um, international competitions, it's, uh, you know, a lot of repertoire, um, which I realized is not really that much compared to a real concert schedule. <laughs> like, I'm um, so uh it seems daunting right now but it's my life now um basically it depends on uh the pieces that you choose um what are the ones that you know really well uh already and what are the ones that you have to learn and and get up to that level so um if you imagine it as sort of a it's like a graph, like, okay, this piece is here. I need to work on this piece until it's 
around there. Um, and I need to sort of bring these up so that they're sort of at a similar comfort level. Like I can play them through, I have a, a vision of the journey of the piece, the characters of the piece. Um, so that's, that's the first step that I take, you know, uh, take the time to build up these new pieces that you've never played. And then um, once you've gotten them to sort of a similar level, uh, it's sort of this juggling act. Uh, it's sort of like cooking a, a big dish that requires a lot of different components. It's like you, you chop the veggies and while you're chopping the veggies, you're cooking the pasta, like you're checking on the pasta and then you're um, marinating the meat and then putting it on the grill and um, okay, that's, that's this much cooked and now we throw the veggies in the, we saute the veggies and then, oh, go back to the pasta, check on the pasta. And um, so everything is, you're balancing everything um, so that everything sort of moves up together incrementally. And um, also if you see it that way, like sort of, um, uh, yeah, if you imagine it that way, then it's a lot easier to, when you get into, when you go to the competition, you know, um, one day I have to play this recital and then two days later, I have to play this totally different recital. And um, those pieces are at your fingertips because you've been juggling them. Uh, so um, that's, that's how I thought of preparation for big competitions. Like uh, ideally, <laughs> ideally you have some months. Uh, I know sometimes uh, even recently, like you might have two months, which is really unfortunate. But, um, you know, as you're doing this process, trying to play the pieces in front of people, you know, seeing what it's like to be prepared and, and present the, the pieces. Um, yeah. As a soloist, you, uh, let's see. Um, let's see, uh, so there's a lot of questions about practicing intonation and, and solidifying left hand. Um, so I don't know if everyone has read uh, my former teacher um, Hans Jensen's new book, Cello Mind. Uh, Shout out to Hans, Hans Jensen. Um, but it basically, there are different types of intonation. Um, depending on the context, you have to uh, know which one works. Um, so first step, you have to know the context. Am I, am I playing a melody um, or am I playing double stops? And even if I'm playing double stops, do, are people going to hear the melody primarily? That's a big thing that I learned. Um, a lot of times we're playing double stops and we're just automatically tuning them harmonically. So lower thirds, lower sixths. Um, but then you listen to it and you hear that the actually the melody in those double stops just sounds out of tune because you're tuning it vertically. Um, the good example is the opening of the Britain first solo suite. Um, the, the ear picks up so it, it doesn't sound as good when you tune it harmonically, um, even if it's a double stops. Because when the sixth is that low, you hear the melody as... Um, and 
and this this is the same in a lot of Bach, a lot of um, solo uh, unaccompanied pieces that we have double stops, but we also have melodies. So um, you you have to think about what the ear picks up. So after that, I I think of usually uh, tuning the the bottom note. Um, to maybe an open string, or, or uh, in this instance, so that the bottom note is sort of objectively in tune with an open string, or, or um, you know, sort of, sort of equal tempered, really, um, objectively, and then I I tune the top note to the bottom note. Um, so that I mean, usually it's it's because the top note harmonizes with the bottom note, um, and uh, that's um, it, it. Depends also that can change if you're already playing the top note first, and then you add the bottom note. Then it's it's usually better to adjust the bottom note to the top note, um, and. Uh, yeah, so, uh, in terms of, um, like, practicing double stops uh, and getting them in tune, it's really, in the end, you have to f feel the, the resonance of the cello. Um, like, for instance, the resonance of, uh, of a fifth it has a very particular feeling to the vibration of, of like, I feel this part of the cello vibrating, um, as opposed to, then I feel it, I feel it lower, I feel the G string opening up. Um, so it's really like, how can I tap into, of course, the overtones, Everyone knows about the, the the overtone series, but also the undertones. Like, how can I activate the 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 lower um, the lower strings so that the whole range is is um, uh, ringing? And um, yeah, that's that's how I think about intonation in general. Um, double stops, uh, how to get the instrument to, to ring more. Um, uh, how do you deal with the resistance to three-dimensional approach? Good question. Um, the, so all of these, the, the, the three-dimensional aspects that I talked about are things that I have developed um, according to my ears. So I'm following a certain phrasing, a certain feeling that I'm going for and think about what to adjust according to that. Um, that I know a lot of people that, you know, don't think about these things and they're, they sound fantastic, you know, they're they still have a three-dimensional expression. Um, so this was, this is really like what I focus on when I, when I play. Um, now, also these things are not uh, overnight remedies. <laughs> um, it took me a long time to feel the limits, feel the, the extent to which I, I use these angles, you know, this angle, this angle, um, how much hair. Uh, so I, it, it's sort of like an organism, really. Like, it evolves. It's always changing. It's, um, it's alive, really. <laughs> Your technique is alive. Um, so it, especially also according to my body type, I have very small hands. Uh, I can't reach an octave. Um, 
I sometimes have uh, tension in my left hand or my right hand. And so I sort of use, think about using my body flexibly um, in order to help me control crazy things like exaggerate. Like that's <laughs> the, that defeats the whole purpose of, of thinking three dimensionally. It's in order for you to have better control over how to express different sides of, of a phrase. Um, so um, yeah, these things take a long time. It took me probably, uh, well, I don't really know the exact, it may be like treating the string as a cylinder that it is. Um, and I'm, I'm adding to it every day. I'm learning, adjusting, um, so yeah, these are not things that you learn in, um, in, uh, technique class or Suzuki or, you know, you're not taught how to do this when you first play the cello. So, um, it's part of the, the journey, the evolution of, of how you, how, how you become the instrumentalist, the, the, and, uh, yeah. So, uh, let's see. Um, oh, uh, as well. Also, does this approach sometimes make string crossings bigger than normal? Um, good question. Yes, I do think about the side of the string when I'm playing fast. Um, when I'm playing flake, almost this feeling that you're playing it in legato, like sort of the phrase is like a line and you're taking it here and there. And um, so that you're going in the string, uh, out of the string, you know, you're uh, playing here, 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 here. You're always um, fast passages, like have to be just as musical as slow passages, um, just as expressive, just as imaginative. Uh, you know, composers write fast things so that it brings us to a new place, a different place, uh, you know, fireworks or waves or, or, or devils skidding across the pond. Um, so that being said, um, let's take uh, the, the last movement of the Britain Suite. Um, I, I do exactly that. I play on different sides of the string. In slow-mo, so... And, and, you know, this is quite exaggerated, but notice how I'm just like manipulating it with my fingers because that's, that's the only, um, that's the only way I'm gonna be able to achieve that in tempo because it's so fast. So instead of, this is me just like going back and forth, point A to point B, which, which I, I hate doing. Let me see if, uh... <laughs> Um, and that actually like subtly makes a different expression, like like why why do these why are these slurred? Like why didn't he? Um, because there there's this sort of like exp like tiny tiny bit of expressive um, expressiveness in these slurs and. Um, when you speed it up and you still take that into account, it makes a big difference in the expression of this fast passage. Um, and, uh, and string crossings, um, it helps a lot to think about which side of the string, because, um, the closer you are to the other string, the next string that you're going to play, be playing, the, it's so much smoother, it's so much easier. You, you only have to move this much to get to the other string. Like, 
Um, let's say... So, I'm playing on the left side of the G string, and then playing on top of the D string, and then playing on the right side of the A string. Right above that G string and then right above that A string. Um, I, I uh, advise everyone to think about that when you have a bunch of string crossings that are really noodly. Um, think of how you can help yourself by being really close to the next string. Um, and uh, that helps you keep the motions, you know, in your fingers, you know, very minimal and very fluid. Um, uh, um, go to warm up exercises. Um, yes. Well, I, um, very first thing, I mean, after I tune the strings, I, I want to warm up my muscles. So like very slow, wide vibrato, I just do. that on all the strings and then I do three octave uh, major scales um, slurring every eight and this is the fingering system um, taught to me by uh, Hans Jensen in his um, Galamian system uh, which I think is very well organized. It's, um, it avoids open strings. Um, and uh, it really like, it solidifies these groupings. Uh, and um, y you can think that way when you do any passage work in any repertoire, like making groupings of things. Um, and uh, in terms of etudes, I, I haven't really played any etudes uh, recently. And um, I really just like turn something that I'm playing into an etude. So um, not saying I don't play it musically. I do it slowly and I think of it very fundamentally and cl clinically. Um, so yeah, I, I basically warm up very slowly uh, smoothly, uh, you know, tuning my awareness, my ears, my feeling, my sensitivity, tuning that so that when I start to actually practice, it's all alert, it's all warmed up, you know. Um, uh, What strings do you have? Oh, um, these are Rondo from uh, Tomastic Infeld. Um, they're really fantastic. I always looked for um, strings that, you know, I this cello is a very dark, sort of chocolatey cello. Um, so I always looked for that extra punch, extra brightness. Um, but all the strings that I tried that had that brightness really lost the depth, lost the range of colors that I wanted to keep. Um, but this past year, I finally they came out with these, and um, uh, yeah, they they're very clear, crystal clear. Um, they cut through, but they have the whole palette of colors and, and nuance that you can play around with. So um, if you are looking to 
um, get some extra punch uh, out of your tello, um, but keep a lot of colors, I suggest um, Rondo. Um, yeah, they've, I'm using the whole set A to C, and they've been working great, and they last a long time, too. Um, um, okay, there's a question about speed, how to develop big sound and speed. Well, um, I, okay, in terms of uh, building up a fast passage, um, I again, I, I think about groupings. So slowly you start, you know, maybe two notes or four notes, groupings, three notes. Um, feeling how these groups uh, feel physically in your hand. Um, and then, you know, thinking about putting each group there in place um, instead of thinking of a hundred daunting notes one after another individually. I think of um, groupings and not only does that make it more musical but it helps you approach each group with an impulse. So like um, let's say I have to shift to um, uh, in pezzo capriccioso, um, uh, the, the moment I give the impulse to, the, the next notes are there. Um, so that when I get these faster, I'm aiming for these impulses, um, that if, if I get those, then that whole group is, is there. It's like, um, what are, uh, there's an old, those old like printers or stamp things where you put the letters and then just stamp, put more letters, stamp. It's, it's like that really. Um, so, and then the faster you get, the bigger the groups should be, uh, just like the bigger, you should feel bigger beats as you get faster in a passage um, so that the, the, you're not feeling stressed about these beats getting faster, they're just getting bigger and actually like, <laughs> feels like it's getting slower actually, but you're just squeezing these uh, groupings into these uh, big beats. Um, so that's, that's how I approach uh, building fast passages. Um, there's a question about um, vibrato. Um, so I think of vibrato also very three dimensionally. Um, like, in order to have the full range of speeds and widths of vibrato, um, depending on what character the phrase is or where it's going. Um, so fundamentally thinking of like, if I want smaller vibrato, I need to make my hand sort of smaller. So, like contracting, making it very compact so that the, the vibrations are within this narrow range. So that all, sort of, uh, basically all the fingers are together. Um, like that. And uh, make, it allows you to focus the, the vibrato a lot more. Um, and then for wider vibrato, uh, the, the opposite, sort of thinking about opening up your hand without, you know, going like this. It's like, how do I, um, 
like the unit that is vibrating your hand uh, should reflect the size and character of the vibrato, I think. So it's small and intimate versus open. Um, that's, that's how I approach vibrato. And in order to have a, um, uh, if you want, a, if there's a passage and you want to vibrate every note, um, you got to sort of think that each finger is like, <laughs> is like one thing. So it's like one thing that's vibrating and you're just moving, you're just placing down different fingers. Meaning like the next one has to be right there ready, like almost vibrating in conjunction with the one before. Um, so that you're not thinking of vibrate each note, you're thinking of, okay, all of these are under the umbrella of one big unit that's, um, that's vibrating uh, throughout. Um, uh, let's see. Um, when starting a new piece of music, what are the first couple things you look at? Um, great question. I, so I think like a lot of us <laughs> out there, I used to make the mistake of like listening to a recording over and over again so that I basically like memorized the piece before I started practicing it. And um, I don't do that anymore because you're not really memorizing the piece. You're like ingraining someone else's imp interpretation of it and someone else's take on this uh, this work of art that the composer has given us, um, which we should each be interpreting uh, ourselves. Um, so I don't listen to recordings before I start a piece, or I try not to, you know, it's it, like, I, I've heard recordings of Schumann Concerto and I haven't played Schumann Concerto, so it's, it, I know how people play it, but um, the more I play different kinds of music, chamber music, um, whatever, like I hear symphonies or piano pieces that these composers have written, and I, um, there's a sort of like harmonic and melodic language that each composer has, um, and not only in the harmonies and melodies, but in the markings. So, um, like, uh, let's say Forte in Beethoven um, is probably, yeah, I'd say, different than Forte in um, Mendelssohn or, or, or Schubert. Um, so, like, the more I play um, these these composers' works, the more I get a sense of their personality, their, uh, yeah, their, their ideas, their language in, in their markings. So that's a very um, important context that uh, you sort of have to develop um, before you approach a piece. And, um, and, and then score study. Of course, score study, like, uh, what's the structure of the piece? Where, um, like, where, of course, cellist, as a cellist, you're usually playing a melody or you're playing a single line. Um, where does that fall? What function does it have in that part? Um, and then, you know, how does this theme develop? Like, uh, what what direction do the keys go in? Um, so, the figuring out these these har this harmonic structure, and um, 
yeah, that, that really uh, makes a big difference in your perspective of um, like, what is this whole journey? Like, where does it go? Where does it end? Um, I mean, I'll say probably all Western classical music before, well, this is hard to say, but let's say before 21st century, like it always, it starts somewhere, it's always going somewhere, or it's always coming back, you know, doing, it's going somewhere. Whether the journey is like, you're going from here to Mount Everest and back, or you're just like going down the street to that cherry tree and slowly walking back. It's, you're always going somewhere and always developing. The sound is always shaping and leading or, or going away or um, so um, sort of being able to envision that from what the composer has given us in those few markings that um, like he's trying to put his imagination onto the paper and um, uh, yeah so this is all before I take it to the instrument um, and uh, you know it it it's a long process but that's what we devote ourselves to do you know as artists like we that's our life's work we we have to that's what it takes to yeah to to do do this life <laughs> um Okay, there's um, some questions about shifting. Um, shifting, <laughs> again, I also think three-dimensionally. So not only is the string a cylinder, but it's suspended in the air. Like, r really, like it's in the middle of the air. It's like floating. Um, and the fingerboard, you know, it's not, it, it's solid and it doesn't move, but I imagine a lot of times going into the fingerboard or, or going over the fingerboard, um, imagining these shapes in the fingerboard uh, and applying them to different kinds of shifts that I want. And um, if, if you imagine sort of like, here's the note that you want to shift to. And I sort of imagine it like this. Oh, that, that kind of hurts. But um, so that you're sliding and then slowly you reach this crevice. Um, and this nook, this cranny or corner, <laughs> whatever, uh, you sort of have to feel it before you shift. Um, sort of like doing it a bunch of times so that you know what it feels like to land right into that corner. Um, sometimes people say like, you know, shift slowly until you hear the note and then like, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> That never worked for me um, because I just, I feel like I'm guessing. I'm like, okay, wait, 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 where's the note? Stop. And uh, for me, I just, I have to feel that in the, in the hand, in the arm. Like it's a very physical thing for me. Um, so yeah, sort of feeling this shape uh, in terms of shifting. Um, and feeling like you're going in, uh, to the fingerboard, um, 
and when you're when you have a passage that involves a lot of like small shifts um uh like uh like beethoven triple there's really tricky um uh, like trying to think of the string as like the train tracks and your finger is the train you gotta like stay on the rail so that you have this grip the whole way um uh, really feeling that string under your finger and 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 uh, it helps you sort of gauge the intervals and feel how the intervals are different and um, it keeps you on the string <laughs> even if you're going really fast um, so yeah um, I guess everything's three-dimensional again <laughs> um, Um, let's see. Uh, there's a question about oppo staccato. I'm very sorry. I, I am the wrong person to ask about oppo staccato. That is something that I have never been able to do. <laughs> um, I, I try very hard, but, uh, it's not in my language. Um, so yeah. I'm I'm the wrong person to ask for a post staccato. Um, phrasing, uh, phrasing I think is utterly connected with bow distribution. Um, so if you imagine the shape of a phrase, like you sort of have to be able to like, if you if you take if you draw on a graph, like how much bow you use uh, along with how much speed it, it should sort of follow that phrase um, and again that uh, that means that you can't be relying on pressure versus not pressure like loud versus soft <laughs> like um, so that the the softer something gets usually like the less bow and more concentrated um and then it, as it gets louder you know make it more you know if it's twice as loud use twice as much um uh a lot of uh younger people just kind of use the bow like uh without enough thought and it kind of it's like too much bow speed or it's like not enough and um, you got to really think about like what is the what is the density what is the volume of this part and and how do I shape it with like a small amount of bow like how do I carve it out and then you know is, is saving bow also is about how deep in the string do I go so that I can go slowly and then I go to a different contact point so that it's less tension so I can move faster. Um, it's uh, the, the three dimensions that I talked about, you're always adjusting these, combining these um, to create, you know, different shapes of the phrase. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, how do I? <laughs> okay, there's a question about um, memorization. Um, yes, uh, I do make particular efforts to memorize a piece. Um, I, when I was younger, it sort of just happened as I would practice things more and more. But um, <laughs> lately, it's sort of like I have to 
really make an effort to memorize a piece well. Um, and that happens for me away from the cello. Um, so I do a lot of mental practice, um, which is really hard actually. If you try to start a piece from the beginning and like imagine all the motions, all the phrasing, all the everything that you're doing, imagining it from beginning to end without stopping is like so difficult to do, but the more you work on it, like the the more you um, yeah envision these uh, like one movement of a piece uh, or one section even um, the more it solidifies in your brain and then that translates directly into uh, when you play uh, and you perform um, it helps especially like when you're when you get in front of an audience and you're um, in order to not be sort of deer in headlights, you sort of envision the, the audience and envision your voice sort of telling this story from beginning to end and what it takes physically, technically, um, to, to do that. Um, uh, that's, that's how I approach memorizing a piece. Um, I would steer clear of listening to recordings over and over again, um, just so that you have, you retain your unique take, your unique, um, approach to certain techniques of a certain part of a piece. Um, and, uh, now there are certain instances in pieces that, like, that's even that's hard to do, like just to envision it. Um, and in that case, like again, in the Britain suite, um, which is really hard to memorize, uh, especially the mar marches. <laughs> kind of just have to like remind yourself like uh like just th think about it over and over again like okay this goes to b flat this time and then c natural and then um so sometimes i have to do that uh, before i can really envision from start to finish uh it's um yeah there are, there are a few pieces that i just have to think about things mathematically in order to remember to remember them um, uh, oh what time is it uh, oh well wow. uh yeah i guess it's been over an hour <laughs> um so yeah, there's a, a lot of questions that I would love to answer, but um, yeah, I guess our time is up. And uh, uh, yeah, if, if you have further questions about things that I talked about that you're confused about or wondering more about, um, you feel free to message me uh, on Facebook or Instagram or um, yeah, it's... Uh, this was really interesting and, and there was a lot more um, involvement than, than I <laughs> expected, uh, which was great. Um, it's, uh, hope I gave you some things to think about during this isolation period and, uh, um, and you know, for the rest of your life, hopefully. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you for tuning in and um stay healthy stay happy and uh if you're having trouble finding inspiration these days you know just you have the time like if there's a melody you want to play just play it if there's a piece that you're not playing in a concert or a competition soon um and you like the piece just play it like you have a lot of time and 
it's coming directly from your heart. So it, just to remind ourselves, like, why do we play music? It's so that we can express really through through the heart, through the depths of our imagination and and um, yeah. So thank you everyone.